Hello and welcome everyone to the main event today. I'm Nita Sani and I'm really pleased to be joined by our special guest today, Florence Weber Zwanig. Hi Florence, how are you? Hi Nita, I'm great, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to have you on board today for our session. Flo, is it Flo or is it Florence? How would you like me to um, speak to you today? Flo is fine. I'm French, so when people say Florence, I don't, I don't even realize they're talking about me. Flo's perfect. Perfect, perfect. And um, Flo, thank you for coming along today. The topic we're discussing is so important. We're talking about diversity in on, in the boardroom. We're talking about what the impact is of the lack of diversity in a leadership team. And you know, Flo. Tell me a little bit about you and your background and, and, and what makes you the expert in the room today. So I'm a diversity, equity and inclusion consultant. Um, I founded diversity in the boardroom a few years ago. And that's kind of taking the approach that, you know, there's a lot of awareness and unconscious bias trainings being done. Mm. Albeit one hour is not going to solve racism or sexism, but that's something. Yeah. And with diversity in the boardroom, we add as well that other component on top, which is supporting people from uh, mar with marginalized identities to really make sure that there's that synergy between what people are learning and the people that need to have really rise through the ranks so we can have like more diverse leadership and more diverse workforce overall. Yeah. And my background was actually in advertising and media for more than a decade right and i hated it for probably all of that time but i did love working with different teams helping mm. them you know like grow as humans work together and all of that so it was quite uh fitting that you know after becoming a mother i transitioned towards that and coaching coaching facilitation and yeah consultancy Amazing. Well, Flo, when I heard your story when we were speaking before the session today, I was blown away at the not just your passion and your belief, but the fact that you've actually made it your 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 your, your work that you do every day and something that you are determined to make the difference. Because we were talking just about um, you know, male to female ratios. We still haven't got that right in the boardroom, let alone, you know, all of the other challenges that we're facing, neurodiversity, um, you know, looking at culture and, 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 and nationalities and uh, race and all the rest of it. But, you know, still the very first protected characteristic that was looked at and considered, still we still have a one, you know. So there's so much work to do. And Today, I'll just do a little bit of housekeeping before we jump in. The format is very much the standard format for the main event. We appreciate everyone that takes the time to sign up or sign up and, and attend live or sign up and watch after, after um, the session has happened because we know that time is precious, but we also know that our promise to you is that we make sure you will take something away that you will be able to apply into your organizations immediately. So that's our promise to you. To do that, it really helps if everyone interacts, gives us your thoughts, and there's a few ways you can do that. So first and foremost, we've got a poll, and the poll today is asking, is diversity and inclusion a priority in your organization? So at the moment, we've got uh, a lot of people saying yes across the entire company, which is a great result. But if you haven't given us your um, scores on that yet, please, have a look at the poll and let us know what the situation is and what the reality is in your organization. Is diversity and inclusion something that very often is just a tick box exercise that everyone has the best intentions, but then you know priorities take over and leaders are almost embarrassed to go back to um, picking up because they think they've left it too long. So is it something that HR is, you know, is it, is it something that just HR is saying, we need to be doing more about this or is it the teams on the ground is it the employees saying look you know we want more representation we want a bigger voice we don't just want a seat at the table we want a voice at the table or actually do we have a leadership team that are talking the talk and are pushing out you know the the right message and the right structure to facilitate um having representation and a broad range of the protected characteristics and diversity in the organization or is it a combination? So what I would ask you is to really think about 
what your world is like at the moment. If it's a combination, just pop it in the chat box. So I'm just gonna do a quick hello, just to show you how easy it is to say hi, to give your thoughts, to give your comments. You may have a question for myself or Flo. And the more interactive it is, the more we can ensure the promise that you will be able to take something away that you can apply straight in your organizations as soon as you're back at your desks. So we promise to keep it about 30 to 40 minutes. So we'll be going for another, about, about another half now to 45 minutes. So Flo, let's jump right in. So first, we've got a few different areas we said we'll cover today. We said we'll speak about the impact and the downfall of echo chambers. And so I'm gonna ask you a, a little bit more about what your experience has been of that in, in the world. And there's a lot of it's obvious, but some of it isn't so obvious as well. So it'll be good to cover that. And then actually what are businesses out there doing at the moment? What elements of diversity are being measured? What's being reported on? Where are the challenges? And ultimately, if as an organization you're looking and thinking, I need to get started, or I started, but I need to build momentum, or, you know, we're great, but let's do a little check to make sure we are great, then we're going to ensure that you not only have the right process and structure, but you also have the right people. So thinking about appointing the right candidate who's going to make that impact for diversity in your organization. So Flo, where would we start? Where do you where do you think we should start in this conversation today? Um, I guess the first point would be all organizations are different, all individuals are different. So obviously everyone's journey when it comes to diversity and inclusion is very different. It's going to start from different places and everybody's lived experiences are going to be different. So as we have that discussion today, there might be like some discomfort that's going to crop up. Some people might feel um, some guilt or a bit of embarrassment. Please, please stay the course, <laughs> stay with us. Discomfort is part of the discussion when we're talking diversity and inclusion. I swear that it gets more comfortable to be uncomfortable at some point. Yeah, and that's a really good point, actually, because, you know, everyone in the room, whether you're in your boardroom, your team environment, or even in the room today, we've all engaged because it's important to us. But I think we all hold our hands up, apart from you, Flo, I think we all hold our hands up and say, we don't have all the answers, you know? And and actually, I think being authentic and honest in a team environment to say, you know, we want to get this right. So many answers are in the, in the individual employees themselves as well. So it's about starting the conversation, isn't it? Yes, exactly. And not being afraid to, as you said, not get it right the first time, like the, the willingness to to go there is what really matters. Yeah, we actually have a comment from Emma in the chat box. Hi, Emma. Thanks for, for giving us your thoughts. So Emma says that she has a standalone EDI role in her organization. And there are lots of parts of the organization where they have some really good intentions, but things sometimes get lost with other priorities. Is this something you hear a lot out there, Flo? Yeah, yeah, this is, this is very common. So many organizations really have their their heart in the right place and are really conscious about you know what what needs to be done but when it comes to being crystal clear on the impact on the commitment and the way to get there this is where where it kind of falls short yeah. and there is well similarly to emma very small diversity equity and inclusion teams small budget sometimes so it can get very muddled so one of the things that um i tend to recommend to the first is be clear on the impact if you're really clear about you know what you want for your organization like i don't know being the the blueprint for belonging in your sector or in your industry you know like really big impact think about really what it is that you're wanting to achieve or you know for anyone that walks through the door with that organization virtually or in the actual office space to feel like they have a place here you yeah. know like make that that big impact crystal clear because just saying we want to improve things there's not the vision behind it basically and mm -hmm. this is where you know when things get busy or or the priorities take over it's hard to stay the course yeah. or it's hard as well if you're you know like the hr or the edi team yeah. to you know go back to the leadership team and be like 
Remember? Remember we said that this yeah. is what we're going for. Yeah. So when there's that clear impact, that clear vision where everybody's on board, the leadership team, the HR team, and, and the wider organization, it's much easier to be like, okay, now that we know where we want to go, let's get there together. Yeah. And the question of impact and the, the, the answer of what that will look like as I said, is very much in your people. So as an EDI leader and as an EDI advocate, you can harness and facilitate and remind, but you don't have to be all the solutions. You don't have to bring every idea and every um, approach. So one of the things that we do in the main group is we hold EDI workshops for organizations and we bring the teams together and we say, in what elements of your day-to-day -day role, in your day-to-day -day experience, would you like diversity and inclusion to be further addressed or higher in the agenda? And actually, you can look at it right from the initial, you know, like, like the life cycle of an employee from the first advert that you put out to attract somebody, from the job description, from the onboarding documentation, from the language you use in onboarding, the induction folder, right through to policies and procedures and appraisal, you know, first of all the language has to flow through then there has to be a layer of how we engage that then layers into you know having um sort of uh, events and things like that and then that also layers into as you spoke about flow helping people to to grow in an organization and really think about what uh, objectives they have to to achieve diverse representation but also success to, to regard you know depending on what what individual needs and people have so the areas of impact are endless and and you can define them all define a few but just get started you know it doesn't have to be a tidal wave right it could be a real consistent drip and I actually think that consistent drip is more effective because employees start to look forward to what's next rather than stop start stop start and it brings as well that element of accountability when you know like or you decide to start however you decide to start or um, if you decide to start focusing on for example one of the protected characteristic from the equality act from 2010 if you bring again your people on the journey being like this is this is how however many hours we have at the moment what's the budget so for this quarter the focus is going to be X or yeah. it's easier to then, you know, be like, this is what's coming next or tell us what you think is more urgent for us to address next. Yeah. But it's really, uh, yeah, that um, those elements of, yeah, impacts, uh, commitments, slash accountability and really transparency to help keep the momentum going. Yeah. So Flo, you've chosen diversity in the boardroom and the senior leadership as your priority and I know when you deliver your work you deliver it across the organization but what made you focus at seeing the leadership what what made you you know think that that's going to have the most impact um, well when you think about an organization and and I've seen that a lot when I was uh, working in, in media agencies you very often have very diverse um entry level employees and the further up you get the less the less diversity is present the less representation is there so this is kind of it feels like it's a bit like um a, a vicious circle that kind of has to be addressed at leadership level yeah where it, this is where you know you start to see those echo chambers where there's a lot of um, white men predominantly uh, cisgender in straight relationships and usually with similar ish um, education backgrounds yeah and it's it, again if if you fit the bill don't feel like you're the problem not at all it's just that this is what creates people who kind of would come up with similar solutions and this is where there, there's an issue because even people that have like the best intentions can't necessarily create inclusion or a feeling of belonging purely because they don't have the lived experiences. Yeah, you don't know what you don't know. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And the limited perspectives actually stifle creativity, stifle productivity and, and the proof of 
God, the statistics I was looking at about diverse versus, you know, very underrepresented boards was scary. So I'm just going to throw a couple out. I don't think they're yours, actually. You you sent these over to me. But the, um, the, the, the one for me that was quite powerful was about gender diversity. And so it, it, McKinsey were the source of this stat and McKinsey found that companies in the top quartile for being diverse on a gender basis within their exec team had 25% more likely above average profitability than the bottom quartile of diversity. So that's huge. I mean, when you think about, you're looking at organizations wanting to be successful and having great share prices, you know, it literally pays to, to have a diversity and representation in the board. I just, the, the results versus the actions are so different. Like, where do you think the disconnect is? What do you think is actually happening in practice when the results prove that, you know, diversity wins in every way? Why do you think there's still such, a, you know, a, a, you know, a high rate of essentially male male pale still don't even know if i'm allowed to say that anymore but you know a very underrepresented board and um, i think there's one thing which is a lot of organization and even the media still to this day are talking a lot about the business case for diversity and if you start to need to build that business case when as you said we've got stats available now we've got all the proofs that we need yeah. um, but if you still go back to, oh, but, you know, we need the, the business case for, for diversity, then it means that the problem is not really in the stats. It's not really in that, it's that you're struggling to take that commitment towards what's really the right thing to do. Yeah. It's, and, you know, the decisions being made today, they have an impact to tomorrow. Like if you're a child who's, you know, considering, I don't know, being an astronaut one day, do they even have an astronaut they can look at? If they're looking at getting into finance, is there a, a famous spokesperson in the finance sector that would look like them? So it's yeah. it's not even, you know, just about the, yeah, the business case and, and the results today, but there's, yeah, much more around it. And there's also the fact that a lot of the goals that are being set are being set really too low. So, for example, the, the Parker Review had set goals for um, ethnic diversity in the boardrooms. And um, the goal was for the FTSC 100 company to have one person from a marginalized ethnic background on a board. It's, it's something, it's progress. But then if you put yeah, that, yeah. so first of all, not all the FTSC 100 have done it yet, most of them, but not all of them. Yeah. And then... When you see that boardrooms are usually between 10 and 15 people, if you have one person of color in that, it's not even a percentage that represents the, the British population. This is, yeah. this is too small. Yeah. And it's also the fact that when you're the only, the only person with a marginalized identity around the table, it's yeah. much harder to speak up. It's much harder to get people to listen. It's much harder to get people to open up. So I think yeah. it's probably a combination of those things as well as obviously many other factors, diversity and inclusion is a, a very uh, complicated topic with many layers to it. Indeed, indeed, it's complex. And yet in some worlds, it still feels almost like conceptual, not practical. And that's, you know, that, that's the biggest downfall is, yes, you're right, I never really thought of it that way. People are still arguing the business case for it. You know, it still hasn't been embraced as the status quo and what we do. Yeah. And what about the, you know, you speak about the, 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 the impact of an echo chamber. Tell me, tell me a little bit more about that. What are you seeing is, is, is happening in, the, in, the, in real cases? Give me some examples. Um, if we take the case, for example, of um, neurodivergence, not everyone understands fully what it means to be autistic, to have ADHD, to be bipolar and all of that. Those are all things where there are still very um, um, stereotypical ideas. And when it comes to the workplace, if basically your leadership team, your boardroom, don't have any ideas about what it means, they can't really like push for change. They can't push for like more inclusive um, workplaces, more inclusive recruitment process. 
Yeah. I think we all saw that after, you know, when we kind of stopped all working from home and some companies maintain that flexibility, which is amazing for yeah, neurodivergent people, yes. for people with medical or other kind of medical conditions. But there's still yeah. companies that were like, you have to be in the office two or three days a week. I I understand, you know, the intention behind it to be like, oh, you know, when we're together, it's better, et cetera, we, we work better, but it's not actually the case for everyone. And there's still to this yeah. day some um, some job descriptions and some um, interview process that involves that. So if you're someone who can't commit to being in the office two or three days a week, whatever the reason, well, that's yeah. already a big barrier. That's already okay. I know I can't apply for that one. Yeah. It says a lot about an organization who have zero flexibility and who aren't willing to see the individual their skill set, their person spec, their cultural fit, their dreams, desires, goals. You know, it really has to be holistic, doesn't it? And this is something when I speak with companies and leaders of organizations, especially around their talent strategy, you know, we speak a lot about the pool of talent, especially in the UK where we're suffering massively with a skills shortage post Brexit, post pandemic. You know, we've, we've really got to be smart about, you know, how we, attract and retain the skills and to to not look at I think or I think leaders are afraid I think leaders are afraid that if they do it for one they have to do it for everyone but even flexible working goes through a legal process where they if there's a business case not to do it that is fair and just obviously you want to have the conversation but if it doesn't suit the business you absolutely have to be able to demonstrate that and likewise with anybody that if they have the right skills, ability, fit and what makes them right for your organization and what makes you right for them, just have a chat. It, it doesn't have to set any precedent. What it's about is saying as an, as, an, as an employer, we look at our employees holistically. We look at them not only as great delivery of the skills we need, but we also look at them as being somebody that can add and enhance value in the organization. As soon as we stop looking at people as valuable if they're in the office or if they're available presenteeism you know that kind of thing the more again we know about the numbers and we know about the results but actually it's also a, a social impact that that this topic has and oh it, it, you know we know it's the right thing to do it's the right thing to do morally it's the right thing to do uh, from a financial perspective and yet as you said we've got these conversations happening in boardrooms that kind of get stuck and nobody can see beyond that little group of people without representation, without diversity, without understanding. Exactly. And there are as well many companies who are using employee resource groups, which are a, a great way to like, you know, get, get different perspectives. And, you know, like, again, when you have like a very small um, diversity, equity and inclusion team to like move certain topics forward but also many organizations see that as kind of a, a free way to mm -hmm. do diversity and you know like people from an employee resource group they still have they still have a job to perform they're they're not paid to do that as a job yeah. they kind of have two things to do and there's and there's different way to to look at it as well to make sure that everybody actually benefits from it and that it's not just like a cheap way yeah. to do inclusion yeah indeed and in terms of attracting the right people to a board tell me what your approach would be like what are you seeing is happening now and where do you think it needs to go i think there's very much that thing for boards but also for for leadership where um it's kind of always the same you know the same the same list of criterias it's like, well, if you're putting out the same list of criteria, you're going to be the same kind of candidates that you got last time. Yeah. So where can you be flexible? Can, yeah. for example, the education piece be flexible? Can someone bring more to the table on one area, but maybe know a bit less about the industry? Or, you know, it's, it's yeah. really that thing. And also, where are you looking? 
because yeah. if you know you have your for example an hr team and you always go to the same place well you're always going to get the same candidates oh absolutely you know an example is one of the big four i think it's kpmg or pwc so don't quote me because i don't have it off the top of my head but they no longer expect a degree you know and that is amazing i know for us as talent attractors for our clients the frustration of where the, a degree isn't needed but is required the the, the lack the, the lack of the pool of potential for, for those clients you know it's looking at what you need in terms of outcomes as opposed to labels you know and if we can rise above that and trust that the vetting process is still as robust the requirements of the role do not move. It's just bringing together the skills and ability in a different way of proving them. And I think that we've got to get more creative as well. I, I, you know, being in the talent industry for 25 years, I know that the, you know, the advert to the CV, to the assessment day, to the interview, to the induction, it has hardly changed. Yes, we do blind CVs. Yes, we do you know, more remote interviewing, we do shadowed, you know, we do different approaches to the to the attraction process, but it hasn't changed much, has it? And, you know, it, there, there's a real reticence for, for, for organisations to be productive. I remember offering um, video CVs and saying, you know, forget what it says on a piece of paper, get 30 seconds of this person, who they are, what they're about, see their impact. No, not really. They'll try it, but we like to go back to what we know and are comfortable with. That's the thing that is difficult because it, it makes in the end hiring resumes as opposed to hiring humans. Yeah. And for example, when you look at, again, leadership and so on, you're going to look for like a very, a very particular set of skills. But then how about, how about their compassion? How about their... Uh, curiosity and understanding because maybe they're going to tell something to one person that's going to work great but it's not going to work at all for someone else and the problem is not the someone else it's just about being able to adapt to be compassionate and all of those things and again this is not something that you can get from a resume or from your typical interviews no you know i hope and we intend to continue to push creativity in the hiring approach, we continue to challenge our business partners on why they need a CV or a certain skill or a certain structure of work. We absolutely respect and understand every business's strategy and we work to achieve that. And we work to enhance the, the pool of potential that can, can deliver that. So, you know, let, let's keep doing that work and pushing that forward. I think there's more webinars and, and conversations to come in that space but let's say where we are today Flo we have majority of boards that are still massively underrepresented you mentioned um something you know when we, again when we were in the debrief uh, pre prior to starting about not for those leaders who don't have uh, uh, the shit the experiences that represent their people or represent the world they want to bring into their organization how else could they go about starting to understand and and formulate a wider and you know uh, engagement and understanding of of, of all the um, you know protected characteristics and and diverse people that they want to and bring in? I think allyship can be so so powerful when you're in a leadership position and that you can showcase your allyship as well. There's lots of very quick ways to do it. Okay. I don't know. It can be like if you have a weekly or a monthly town hall, it can just be, okay, so I've been following um, that account who's um, a disability advocate on Instagram, or I've been reading that book. Uh, it opened up my mind so much about this, this, that. It's like you don't, I mean, obviously, no, we all have different lived experiences. You're never going to get at the same lived experiences as someone else but it's really like showcasing that you're doing the work yeah. and it's going to encourage as well people around you to yeah. do the work so it's, mm -hmm. it's it's something so easy and so simple to do yeah. Even and it might seem person. like not a lot but you know i think as we said about it doesn't have to be a tidal wave it can be a drip effect of look 
we're, we're in this space and we're here to stay and we're going to be making consistent steps in the right direction. I think employees will buy into that far more than a big showcase and then nothing. Reverse mentoring, that could be a fantastic way of, you know, opening up um, more diverse experiences and understanding. And to, to the point earlier about employee resource group, there are so many leaders at the moment that are kind of deflecting questions around diversity and inclusion to, oh, you know, we've got that employee diverse group for that. But if, you know, yeah. they were taking it on and like, oh, OK, this is not something I know about, but I can look into it. This is not something that mm -hmm. I have experience with, but let me investigate. I think like, you know, showing your people as well that you're really committed to the work is yeah. And as you said, well, trip, trip, yeah. Yeah, we, we have one particular client who are actually US based and they have different laws and, and regulations, but they obviously have their business board, but they also have culted, curated a diversity board who are from certain members of the organization who then represent. So even if there is only one EDI leader, they've created a board of representation that can sometimes become, um, you know, a, 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 a melting pot of new ideas or where there are questions that the board can't answer. They, they even um, engage with the board to give them insights that the board aren't aware of. So they become advisory as well. So it's a, another way, you know, of organizations, if they haven't got it at board level yet, they can still bring that expertise and, and, and awareness in to their world. A strong show of commitment. Absolutely. Walking the walk, right? Not just talking the talk. And, you know, so one of the areas that we um, said we would cover and look at is all around what is being reported and what is being missed right now. If, if, a, if a leader is trying to look and understand what, what is happening out there? I, I, you know, I've done my research online. I've looked at some stats, but you know, what should they be looking for, and what what are people missing? So, when it comes to boardrooms, the two kind of yeah, main characteristics that are currently being reported on are um, ethnic background yeah. and uh, gender. And it's yeah, as you said, doesn't even cover all of the characteristics. Yeah from the the equality act and then there's also other stuff that are not even in the equality act are you uh, are you an extrovert or an introvert mm. are you are you actually fat or th there's like so many things that are not even covered in that so mm. when you see that for boardrooms they only report on those two things it's a bit it's limited. a bit scary for 2023 mm. yeah <laughs> and, and when it comes to leadership sorry go ahead no, no, I was just saying the world's become a smaller place and we are all so much more connected that if the if the sort of perspective of, of leaders doesn't reflect that, it, as you said, in this day and age, that's that's scary. There's no excuse. Yeah. And it's again, it's it can be sometimes it's very difficult to understand just the fact that there are very different lived realities yeah. uh, there's so many times where i heard about oh yeah but you know that person is that person is a bit rude or you know that person oh i don't think they're really meant for client services and then when you start digging you understand that the person mm. is actually autistic and are delivering their job brilliantly albeit not not wrapped up in a pretty bow as some people would expect it to be when delivering it yeah. But it's really that still lack of um, lack of understanding. And mm. this is, again, something that should come from the top. Yeah. Like this is uh, people should in a leadership position in boardrooms should have some form of understanding of other people's lived realities. Yeah, indeed. And we touched on so many different approaches and we've literally skimmed the surface of such a small part of diversity. But I think what I take from this is that you know, if you want to start making real impact with little effort, it's get your senior leaders and your leadership team in the space of diversity, inclusion, belonging, equanimity for your people. So let's start the conversation. And whether you've, you know, you're watching this and you're thinking, I don't know where to start or whether you're thinking, you know what, I did a bit, but, you know, we probably need to get back to it. 
or like you know like emma mentioned in here it, you know i've i've got the thoughts but i don't have the people power um we're here to help so we're probably tying up in a, in a few minutes the um the chat room's been quiet but the poll's been a bit busier currently we've got some really positive results we've either got uh, that it's across the entire company um, or the second is that the wider employee base are leading on that. So I would say if your people are asking for it, please, please listen, please start the conversation. Please think about, you know, what, whether it's a, a workshop, whether it's a, a town hall, or, you know, just start the conversation. And anytime you want more support in that space, both Flo and I are available. We're going to be sending out a recording of today's session. We're going to be um, sending our details, so both of our numbers, email addresses and things like that. But also our LinkedIn, lots of um, thought pieces and advice go on LinkedIn from us. So please don't be shy about if you haven't had thoughts, questions or ideas answered today, or if you don't know where to start, please reach out. We're here to help. And there is so much complimentary advice that we're already putting out there that you can start applying in your world. So it doesn't always have to be a massive cost to your business to, to start achieving results. Flo, is there anything you'd add to that? No, I mean, you were crystal clear about it all, but yeah, don't ever hesitate. Um, yeah. uh, as as we said many times here, and as Mita mentioned a few times as well, it, there's no small way of starting in diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's just about, yeah, going ahead. Yeah, very much. And the, the, the benefits are infinitesimal, you know, you not you don't just get great employee morale. You get great retention. Your employees become your biggest fans. They're attracting. You know you don't need our little you know recruitment firms working for you. You're attracting your own people directly because you're such a great organization. You know you your your brand reputation, your, your the perception of you as a brand in public, and with social media, small or large, you can make a massive impact on your brand. So. Get these stories out there. If you are doing the work and you think, well, how can I showcase this more? Get videos out there about what you're doing. Get case studies, testimonials. And it really enhances innovation and creativity. And again, board, board, boardrooms will be more successful. Results will be more impactful. And ultimately, everyones it's a win-win, isn't it, really? There's no downside to doing the work. So tell me, if you were to give a parting message or if you were to say, you know, what the first thing that somebody watching this uh, webinar would do, what would you suggest that should be? Go back to your impact and, and your vision. Even if it's somewhat clear already, it never hurts to revisit that. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, Flo, thank you so, so much for being our guest today. I, I hope we can have you on another main event very soon. As I said, I feel like we've only just scratched the surface, but hopefully everyone who's attended today has, has been able to take away something that they can apply. And we hope to hear from you soon with any more support we can give you. But in the meantime, really go back and start thinking about how you can get diversity into your leadership team. If you've already started, Let's improve it even more and let's get winning out there. Thanks, everyone. And Flo, thank you so much. Bye for now. Thank you.